This thing right off the top is so hard to nail. <laughs> That's hard to do way down there. I'd like to do it up here. But then again, I don't have a G-Bender to make that thing work. He said he was gonna send me a G-Bender. I'm gonna hold him to it. I like this part a little bit later in the solo where it does that. That again, you really need that beat, that G-Bender. That is so cool. Yeah. And then he also, he, he showed that one uh, lick from, um, it's not this song. That's going in my quiver. Just like this one. I'm glad that I finally got confirmation that I did rip that off from Brad Paisley. Hey there, loyal Shred with Shifty viewers. I am Chris Shiflett, your host as always, and boy, oh boy, do we have a fantastic show for you today. Brad Paisley is gonna take us to school in a minute. He's gonna take us to guitar school in a minute. But first, I wanna remind you, make sure you get those tickets to my solo gig down in Austin on October 6th. It's an ACL late night gig with, uh, with my new friend, Ellis Bullard. Uh, you're going to want to pre-game the big show on the 7th by coming out to uh, Antone's in beautiful Austin. So get those tickets now. And yes, there is still time to pre-order my new record, Lost at Sea. If you go to chrisshilfittmusic.com. And when you do, you're going to get four alternate versions of some of the songs off the record sent right to your inbox. I think we're calling it like the Studio 606 sessions or something like that. You'll see. Pre-order and you'll get it right to your inbox. It's great. And look at this incredible stuff that you can buy. I haven't even opened my copy of the vinyl, and which I'm going to do here in a moment. But look at this. Wow. This is really good. What team from North London does this just kind of remind you of? I'm not going to say it out loud, but I think most of you know. But even if you're not an Arsenal fan, you can still, you know, you can still by the scarf. I should have pre-cut this. This is insane. Look at how well wrapped my record is. <laughs> that, that is one heck of a quality wrapping job right there. But here, let's look at that. Okay, so that's the front cover. It's called Lost at Sea. That's me jumping out of a boat with a guitar. Where am I going? What am I doing? Why am I jumping out of that boat? No one knows. Okay, and then if you get this off, look at that back cover. Look at that. We got some song titles. We got some credits. Produced by Jaron Johnston from the Cadillac 3, so you know it's a quality production. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid growing up and I was buying records, I would always be so upset when I'd get the record and then I'd pull it out and just be like a white, empty sleeve. But not this record. Heck no. Woo! <laughs> look at that. There, look at that, huh? You get that nice picture of me in a tackle shop, just doing cool tackle shop stuff. And look at that, all the lyrics and credits right there. You can sing along. I mean, it's just fantastic. Everything you always wanted. Oh, and that's not all. Fancy red vinyl. Fancy, fancy red vinyl, which also kind of like, you know, kind of suggests a certain North London football team. We're not gonna dwell too heavy on that, you know what I mean? That went a little long. We could, we could just, we'll snip that in post, okay? Hey, listen, also, follow me on socials, right? And we're gonna put all the socials right here. And don't forget, you can always watch the ad-free version of Shred with Shifty, plus exclusive clips you're not gonna get anywhere else over at volume.com slash shifty. All right, let's get to the interview. All right, there is no question that Brad Paisley is one of the hottest pickers in all of country music today. And if that isn't enough, he's also one of the nicest dudes out there, and he's always been extremely generous with his time. I've interviewed him twice now. And this episode's kind of funny because I've been bugging him all weekend leading into it about, you know, when we were going to do the interview, not realizing that he was in the middle of putting on a big charity concert up in Santa Barbara. And all weekend long, I was just bugging him, just blowing up his text. When are we doing the interview? What time? What day? Blah, 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 all that sort of thing. And we never exactly, like, 
locked in which solo we're going to do. So I kind of half learned a few of his, which is very evident once we get into the lesson portion of, of the show, because I'm pretty much hacking my way through the whole thing. But Brad was totally cool about it, very patient. He's a great teacher. As you're about to see, this is Brad Paisley on Shred with Shifty. So what's funny is I play these solos um, different live, I realized, than they <laughs> Of the record. So I, went, I went and looked up a couple of them, like Mud on the Tires we talked about and, yeah. uh, and American Saturday Night and Water. Um, they've evolved they, in, in the years since I recorded the record. They're all a little different now. Yeah. Live. And I was like, for like Mud on the Tires, there's this lick that goes... Let me turn up a little bit. It's like that. Yeah. And live I've been going. And it's like not a different note, but I won't learn it where it's that. Yeah. I'll tell you something funny, as you are probably not surprised by this at all. Pretty much everybody I've interviewed so far is like, I don't know how I played it on the record. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's uh, I only did it that time once. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. I mean, I, I learned these in the beginning, usually when we start a tour with it, but my on the tires was like 2003. It's been 20 years. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like in 20 years, it's like, uh, it is, it's, it's an anthropology experiment. Totally. Yeah. No, it's evolved. It's supercharged. It's grown. It's an adult now. Or it's or it got dementia at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. You know, I, I got to tell you, um, I felt like such an idiot this morning. I realized, uh, and I knew you were up in, in Santa Barbara, you know, this week. But in my mind, your show at the Bowl was like sometime this summer. And, right. and I just, I wasn't thinking that you were up there to play a gig and I totally uh, just realized that this morning. Like, oh, wait a minute. He played the bowl last night, and I've been bugging him all weekend about doing my dumb show. So um, sorry about that. And how, how did it go? Oh, it was great. We, uh, th we did it for charity. Uh, Every Dime went to Unity Shop, which is a great, really great charity that uh, exists. It, it's a grocery store that feeds uh, people that are down in their luck. If you qualify, you don't pay a dime. And so the thing we started in Nashville, my wife and I called the store, was based yep. on Unity Shop. That was the idea was from what they do here in Santa Barbara. Oh. Uh. And so I still try to give back to that place. So I first of all, as you know, the bowl is the most beautiful venue in the world. Oh yeah. And so to get to play there anyway is fun. And so we didn't we didn't make a dime. We did this for, it was me and Dawes, uh, my buddies. Oh. I absolutely adore Taylor Goldsmith and that band. And um, so they actually came in and played and we did some stuff together. They Taylor and I wrote a bunch of things lately. And so we did a few new songs. And Oh, really? What's, the, what's that? You've been writing with Taylor Goldsmith. Do tell. Is that for your new record that uh, I saw you have a new label yeah. home and a new record and everything? Are you? Is that what you're writing with him for? Yeah, we were writing, we actually even began writing before I even finalized that deal, but we, we had been toying with trying to see what we could come up with together, and uh, it's been great. I mean, he is, he's a wordsmith, he's, he's really a brilliant guy, and more than that, we've become really dear friends, and the chance to collaborate's been amazing, and uh, yeah, the stuff we've written has been great, because he, he comes at it from a, an entirely different background. Um, but he is a player. He's such a good guitar player, as you know. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. So to sit there with those sensibilities, we're sort of trying to out melody each other when we write, which is great because I don't write with a lot of people that are that are sort of um, what you would call sort of a, an expert on melody. Most of my writers are more country writers that specialize like in you know lyrics and hooks and things. And sure, well, he's a new he's a new animal for me, and it's been great. Oh, wow. That, that is really cool. I love those guys. They, they, like, I remember when I first heard them and they were pretty young. And my first thought was like, God, those guys play with like a level of maturity that I did not have at that age. They really seem like, like tied into a kind of a classic California mellow sound. 
Yeah, there's something else. They yeah. they really are that classic. They're like my favorite country rock, rock, whatever you call that thing, that California country rock, Eagles, Jackson Brown thing. And they're the, the heir apparent to that, I think. Yeah. And from Malibu, but somehow they don't surf. So I don't, you know, whatever, go figure. That's what he said. There's a line in, there's a line in, uh, it, co- it comes in waves, that song. He did it last night, which is, he says, you know, uh, kid who grew up in a beach town, never learns to surf. Somehow that basically sums up my time spent here on earth. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> that's good yeah. yeah i think i gave him a hard time for that when i interviewed him for my podcast but yeah uh it's not too late we'll get him out there in the surf we'll get you out in the surf one of these days buddy how have you kept both arms as a guitar player that's the scariest thing to me is the the idea <laughs> of the shark attack i mean i saw soul surfer i know oh that. yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's how we keep you folks out of the lineup right that's right well let's jump into it um you know, I know you took a lot of lessons when you were a kid, but I'm curious, like, what, what you were like as a guitar student. You know, this is a guitar show. So were you, like, a studious discipline? Would you go home and practice your scales kind of kind of student? I had these old dudes that were the greatest local guitar hero people, but they weren't local guitar hero guys that got up and did, you know, I don't know, Freebird and and pentatonic scales. They were Les Paul, Merle Travis, Chet mm. Atkins level players. Right, right. Roger Hoard and Hank Goddard, these two guys, Roger's still alive. He's amazing. Hank has since passed away, but got to see my success, which was great um, for him because he, I started playing, I started taking lessons from him and his daughter when I was nine, I think, you know? So, yeah. So like, but he was the, it was that, it was this stuff. It was like the, you know, the. So I'm learning that at 12. Wow. Um, You know, the, the thumb style Chet Atkins stuff. And And um, were you listening to that style of music? I mean, this would have been what, in the eighties or something, or, or maybe even a little after. Yeah, I was. I mean, I had a grandpa that raised me on that. So, I mean, I remember getting to high school and kind of realizing I need to learn some Clapton if I'm going to get a date. There's no, <laughs> no. This one, country oh, jazz isn't hooking me up no, at junior the, high. No. The train wasn't, the girls weren't running for. <laughs> I mean, back in the barn dance days, and I'm sure you could, you know, Chet Atkins had him flocking to him, but it wasn't working yeah. in the 1990s. I mean, that's interesting because that's so much harder than, like, what most of us were learning at that age, you know, the, you know, like that kind of stuff. So when you got to the point of learning the more, like, you know, traditional, whatever, classic rock, rock and roll kind of stuff, you know, Eddie Van Halen, whatever kind of thing that you also added into, into your knowledge base did that seem easy after woodshedding all this crazy hard complicated chet atkins style stuff i don't know not really easy it was different i mean you know when when it's like the uh what i you know when you learn how to teach or something it's like you you're like uh Okay, wait. First of all, I need a distortion pedal that's better than what I've got, and then it's you. You kind of realize also, uh, oh, they're thinking almost completely differently than I am. Right. You know, when it came to to heavy metals shredding and the picking and and that, you know, I was so used to this that I still sort of play like when I do anything where I'm playing a, a typical rock lick, even a even something from ZZ Top. It's like you know. <laughs> I'm doing it country style. Right. As opposed to what Billy does. So it's like, you know, some of it was like, in some ways, more just easier to learn. Um, but there's a, but what's harder to learn when you're used to a certain, there's a certain feel and vibrato in bluegrass or country, you know, in a Haggard tune. They, uh, you know. When you, like, you know. 
that is not that similar to a blues feel. It sounds similar. Or, but when you, but immediately that's country when I play it. If I handed this guitar to Robin Ford, and we've done that, like he's come over and he plays a telly from time to time, we don't sound the same on a telly at all. (laughs) But you know, his, his vibrato that is more of that. Which doesn't sound like when it's country, it's. It's different. So, yeah. So what is it? What is Because you're really hitting on something that's really important that I found that I that I discovered myself when I start first started trying to play country music and specifically like old style Merle Haggard, Buck Owens, that kind of stuff that you just mentioned, where I, I was was so it was so hard because I was like, I, what am I doing wrong? I'm, it's the song is like three chords and then I got to go, you know, you know, or whatever yeah. it was. But it just doesn't sound right. Like, so what is that sort of intangible thing you're talking? It's like a style uh, affect or something. Like, what is that that makes it country? I that's I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, that's I'm, so I'm, hard for us rock guys to figure out. It depends. I mean, it's a pluck. There's a pluck right. to it for the most part. Um, like these guys, so many of them used a thumb pick, even right. Chet, like Brent Mason style. Brent Mason, Steve Warner, they use thumb picks. I don't know how they do it. They can do a Brent Mason can play one of these <laughs> rhythm parts with a thumb pick that I would sound like a first year guitar student if I tried to do that with a thumb pick. And but I think it's something about the slide into the note. And there's a there's a trick to blues that blues players just get by osmosis. That's sort of this, it's something probably if you, if you were to really like study it in a scientific way, it has probably to do with the way the note gets flattened or sharped depending on how you squeeze it. And I, cause I think, you know, when I think of something like, uh, let's see, like Buck Owens or something, you know, when you think of the, the stuff that he would do, and that plucky thing that's like, that's that sort of. That, right. That's immediately that sort of your, your little. As opposed to blues where it's sort of like, you know, if you did something similar, it seems like it's more like. You know, there's, there's this. Like B, I did a song with BB King um, years ago. Uh, greatest day ever watching him in the studio when we went in and recorded him. And he's sitting there with Lucille and he is, there's something about, I don't know, one note and it's different. It's just this sort of, and, and that vibrato thing, John Mayer did a thing once, at, it was either at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or somewhere where he, played you know it was like he he's he's like buddy guy and he plays the buddy guy thing and he's like bb and he draw and then he goes into like I, it was it, and every time he did something he had their patented vibrato every one of the mm. one of the things he did was blues and it and he captured in three notes who they each were so i don't know i i'm not exactly sure but i think there's something about the pluck and the attack and the slide up to the note that's like a <laughs> It's immediately country, you know, and it, it's a few a few less chromosomes immediately. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's it's so true that there's something in that style that just you hear it, you recognize it, but it's hard to isolate. Yeah. Here's a question for you. I I, I interviewed John Osborne, who I'm sure you know uh, recently. He's great, F- amazing, amazing player, and and I asked him, and I'll ask you the same thing. Um, you know. You guys are such rippers, and country music seems to have always embraced ripping, not just ripping guitar, just ripping musicianship in general, but specifically guitar players, my God. Um, Why do you think country music, when rock music stopped embracing lead guitar playing, country music 
kept embracing it. Well, there came this movement in the 90s, yeah. which was the Alan Jackson, Clint Black, Garth, all that. And they were all imitating Buck and George Jones and Merle Haggard. Thank God that's who their influences were. And that, that was a resurgence of all of that. And as you know, the Buck Owens, Merle Haggard stuff, they were never afraid to take a ride on one of the instruments, a steel fiddle, yeah. a, a, a guitar, heck, Buck did instrumentals. I mean, and uh, I think that influence, it became very uh, prevalent in the sense that like an Alan Jackson record, whether it was Chattahoochee, it, all of Matt Solis, you know, and, and they also were working at that time. They all had Brent Mason solos. <laughs> they did. Yeah. And they were all working at that time too, to, um, to sort of make something signature in like, like it wasn't just, you know, chords or anything like that. And I think it was maybe because it was the left turn from grunge, which was kind of shying away from it. Like grunge yeah. was like, it, they for a while it was like not cool to have a solo. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that was the the they were like whoa 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 no, <laughs> you know. Even if was was important. was there a massive influx in Nashville at that time from like L.A. heavy metal guys <laughs> moving out there trying to get gigs? Well, yeah, I mean Dan Huff became the number one producer in town for quite a while and still kind of is, and he's like, and here he was, he could play all of that, and meanwhile he's playing the solos on like there were some Clint Black records where. Dan Huff basically took, instead of plugging in through a Saldano or something, he plugged in uh, a, an MXR Dynacomp into, a, into a, a Fender or something, and then blew a solo with heavy compression that was like, you know, <laughs> one of those, you know, and it's like, you'd hear that in the middle of a song. And it's clean, and, and it was like, uh-oh, here they come. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, what was the first thing you learned, the first lick that you learned that made you think, all right, I got this now. I'm, I'm a lead guitar player. I'll call it, I, I'll call it Boogie Woogie. My grandpa loved this lick. It was his thing. It, it was something when, you know, I had graduated from... And... You know, where you're learning the... Uh, oh, like learning old fiddle tunes or something? Yeah, Yankee Doodle, one note, and then two notes. And then all of a sudden, my guitar player, the teacher, this guy that was this old jazzer, he wanted me to learn this lick, and it was this... It was an extension of... It was basically like boogie-woogie boogie, woogie piano on the guitar. It's like... <laughs> And I learned this, this in. So when I learned that, that was the first thing I learned that didn't sound like I was reading from the Mel Bay book. <laughs> and it was like, yeah. there it was. Freedom at last. No, yeah. And, and I remember my grandpa throwing his hands up in the air and going, he's got it. He's got it. The boy's got it. He <laughs> was like, next stop, Nashville. Yeah, he wasn't wrong. It probably took a couple more years, but yeah. It took a while. You had it. Um, okay, what when you go into, I ask everybody this same question. When you go into a guitar store, maybe it's Groon's, maybe it's Carter Vintage, whatever it is. Uh, maybe it's Jensen's there in Santa Barbara. Um, and you pick up a guitar you have never played before, and you want to put it through its paces. What is your guitar store lick? What do you play? Oh, that's a great question. We used to laugh, you know, we used to laugh when you, I would always go to the Arlington guitar show and uh, it, it, it was always this pentatonic A thing. You heard in every aisle of the Arlington, Texas guitar show, the vintage show, it was, it was every aisle, you know what I mean? It was like pentatonic hell. Um, in my case, I think it's probably an E because you can hear you, you, you can hear the sustain immediately if it's like I want to hear whether guitar is gonna like hold that chord. 
I'll probably do that. You know what I mean? Oh, nice. I think you just you just won the guitar store lick sweepstakes of the show so far. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty damn good. But it's like, you like do that. That, if you do that, you got, you know, it's different than up here on the neck, which doesn't tell you anything about it. Um, it's that. <laughs> You can hear it sing, baby. Hey, while we're on the subject, what is that guitar that you're playing right there? I forgot to even ask you about that. Uh, this is a Bill Crook Esquire that he built me years ago, and I've got it out here. It's a, uh, it's a, like a Sparkle Paisley. It's got a just a single pickup. Really simple, you know. I used this on a couple of songs on a few of the records over the years. And who's the builder? Bill Crook. Oh, I'm not familiar with him. What's what's his deal? Like super supercharged uh small builder out of West Virginia. You can look up it's Crook Custom Guitars, look him up. He okay. uh, he only makes about sixty guitars a year, I think. He mm. uh custom makes he's an expert on Paisley. He really ah. does he was one of the first ones to figure out how to do the paper right and do um and you know, and and, and sort of specialized in that and early on in my career i was touring with like one guitar i had this 68 paisley telly and like the one you're holding there and oh like you had a real one you got a real one that was my my main old guitar i had bought bought one years prior and you know it was like there i was going around with that and i didn't really have a backup so he built me one and then this bender is uh something that he also started to perfect this is a mcveigh but i use i use a lot of glacier benders which joe glacier made my first bender you know joe in nashville yeah and i actually this this one here is a has the glazer uh, uh b bender mod in okay well so is the it, but is that one you've got there is that a g bender and a b bender just is it g? both i don't g. G. use g i've got a b but i i never use it it's always g for me how did you how did that wind up becoming your thing i didn't realize that uh, about your that you uh play a g bender so much like why g bender instead of a b bender uh i think i like the sound of it better also jimmy olander was doing that with diamond rio and he was killing it with like he he had both but he favored the g and i was like the sound of it because like a b bender is a really cool thing but you're immediately bernie ledden or you know you're immediately in that yeah that or when you're on this G, it's more steel guitar like. You know what wow. I mean? And is is that set up the same as a B bender, like with the little pole right there? Because I thought like G benders, I had thought like when you have a G bender and a B, and I realize that's just a G bender, but that they did it off the back. Uh, mm-hmm. strap lock or something like well, that. So well, you, it, you, what, what Joe does on his doubles is is down and then you clip one to your belt and it's out. So you go out for the B or G or down. Oh. So one or the other. So you can, you can go you know, like that basically. But you look like you're sword fighting. <laughs> yeah, that, that is so much more, like I can't even, like I, I don't trust myself to play my actual G bender li- B bender live. Right. Because I, I bend it out of tune when I don't mean to. And then I, just, I don't know. And then I forget like where I can get that whole step bend. And then it's just like, I think overthink it. You know what I mean? I'm going to challenge you. For, <laughs> I'm going to send, all right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you a guitar with a G bender in it. And I'm going to challenge you to play a G bender something solo or lick in the next Foo Fighters record. You have to do it. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I, I will accept that challenge, but I actually, when we were recording out in Nashville a few years ago at uh, Zach Brown's place, I borrowed a, a B-Bender for the song that we were doing there, and I worked out a little uh, B-Bender lead, and it got freaking shot down before it even before it ever made it onto tape. That's because it's a B. You need the G. The G <laughs> well, there you go. That's right. Yes, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you up on that challenge. I like that challenge. Did we just decide what song uh, in the preamble? It can be any of any of these that that you think uh, people would want to figure out along with me because I'm figuring it out too. Like I said, it's different now. 
the, well, uh, I like what I like what you showed me before we jumped in here on that on how you play that mud on the tires. So that was mud from mud on the tires, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'll play you right now the way I do it live, and then I'm going to show you what I think the record has. And the record's better. It's just that it's evolved to be not that. But um, at the end of the end of the song. It's a solo that ends the song. It's not even in the middle. It's an interesting thing. It's kind of a, a break at the end on this. But I, I remember figuring, well, the thing I like about this solo, the Mud on the Tire solo isn't flashy. It's not like, it's not meant to be like, whoa. It isn't flashy. You're saying it isn't flashy. To me, it's not. <laughs> it seemed flashy to me when I was trying to work it out before we jumped on here. <laughs> the, the flashy one to me is American Saturday Night, which is that, it, it was just like a. There's a lot of that stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on in that. Yeah. You know. That's, that's oh, my- you know. Be- before we get into mud on there, will you just explain how you play that lick? Because that is that is really great, and I can see from where your hands just were that I did not figure that out right. I was doing something like. That's not oh. a bad way to do it. That might even be better. <laughs> well, how do you actually do it? So these two. So. Oh, okay. Wait, what? So, which string are you on on that? B. Second string. And then it's twelfth fret. And then you, are you pulling off to the open G? Yeah. So it's, so I and it's funny when I slow it down, forget it. I can't even figure it out. But it's like. Uh, amazing you know i've I've got a little glitchy internet so i can't your hands are a little blurry but i'm gonna go back and don't worry about the fact that the open g is not in the chord because you're only kind of using it as like a ghost note so it's like so you slide slide up on the d string yeah to the yep. and then you take a full a chord like that and slide up to it and go wow you bend the whole thing and are you throwing the the uh, g bender in there when you're doing that little band no or are you just 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 grabbing What's really fun is to keep your and not bend your A note. Oh man, that takes some that takes some some working out. Style points. I like that. That is very good. What it'll take a toll on your hand after a while, but full chord bends are really fun because a lot of people don't think to do it, but it's like you don't have a whammy bar with one of these, so it's like you gotta, right. you if you gotta if you're gonna go, and maybe that's even a feel thing in country like that I think is really cool is like if you play because we're so clean usually with what we're playing. There's no, it's not a, a grimy old amp typically. It can be pretty clean, so it's like yeah. even if there's hair on an AC30 or something. It's still like, like if I just do that, it doesn't have any soul. If you go. Wiggle the chord. That's still a guitar trick. They've right. always been to do that because they're nowhere near the near in pitch half the time. <laughs> right, they're going to slide it around in and out. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. That's where like the style comes into it, and like um, 
you talk about not having a lot like a wall of gain like a heavy metal guitar player you know classic rock guitar player but where does where does that tone come from i know you're you're uh you've played through like what train wrecks and ac30s and things like that but do you keep them kind of clean it doesn't sound like there's a lot of hair on them so is that like a like what's your go-to compression pedal or something to, to make it kind of do that thing i never really use compression live um i i always uh I run them at the the edge of what's what would be considered clean. They're definitely dirty, but yeah. they're clean enough. I mean, it's right. I don't like the sound of an amp live. Like this is way too clean for me live right here. Okay, when I'm doing with the little amp in the room here. Yeah, you know, it's great to hear the notes, but live I'd be I'd be dying right now because I wouldn't be able to compete with the band a little bit. So it's got hair on it, but it's that class A AC thirty like with with the Doctor Z's that I run. There's a place around noon on the on the something like the Z Rec amp where it's just right where if you're plugging if you've got this output of pickup which is probably around seven K and you're into that amp, it's gonna it's gonna be just dirty enough. It's gonna be Really? Like, no compression. What about a boost? Do you throw like an EP boost on there or anything? No. I mean I'm just hitting that this is the other thing about AC thirties too. When you do when you do a boost, it's dirty. Like and it, it, those amps are just, they're not Fender Twins. So it's like, so, I mean, it's just me straight in with like a, a delay pedal. Like there's a little delay on this here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a little bit of delay like that. And sometimes reverb, sometimes not. And then typically just turn the amp up till it sounds good. Yeah. And there's a point when it does. And there's a point when it gets too much. Are you still playing real amps on stage? Yeah. Really loud. Like last night, playing with Dawes. Um, Taylor loves, like, I think he's got a Fender Princeton or something. Plus, uh, he's well, actually what he used last night was, uh, he had a, uh, we have, um, either a bad cat or a, uh, matchless. Um, and so he had the one amp, but I had these multiple, multiple, you know, Dr. Z, I've got a DB4 he makes and a, uh, and a, and a Z rack. And I've got, you know, these two, basically four, 12 inch speakers blasting and it's loud. And he was like, Whoa, <laughs> he hadn't been out there in my, in front of my rig before. And it's like, right. Well, you want, you want a couple more amps just to play <laughs> 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 enough my ears. I'm good. But, but I'm definitely what you would consider too loud. If, if I was the backup guitarist yeah. or a lead singer, I would have been fired <laughs> right. by now, but I would be a lead singer, so they can't do that. That's the beauty of being the main man. Turn your amp up as loud as you want it, baby. Nobody's going to argue. Nope. Hey, for okay, so Mud on the Tires, when you were in the studio recording it, do you remember what guitar, what amp, and uh, I mean, you just said you don't really use a lot of pedals, so may, if any pedals at all, what what your setup was in the studio? Yes. It, in the studio on Mud on the Tires, I used... Uh, a combination of things I had. I think that's my, that's probably my, it's either my 68 Paisley Telly or it's a 52 Telly that I had that has since been refurbished since it was in the flood in Nashville. Mm. Um, but it was one of those two guitars through uh, my, I had a 63 AC 30 that was my main amp back then. And a Dr. Z, what he calls a Z28, which is essentially, so the two of them together, and I took the Z28 and ran it through a 15-inch JBL speaker. So it's that the Z28 is kind of a Fender Deluxe. So imagine a Fender Deluxe through a 15-inch JBL, which mm. gives it some sort of like thump, you know, and yeah. added that to the AC30, which AC30s don't really have thump. It's different than that, as you know. It's more like... I, I, I describe AC30s as if this is a Fender and these are the frequencies a Fender has, an AC30 fills in the gaps. That's where all the frequencies are there when you play that. And, and so that Z plus that was really magic for a song like this. And that, be, you know, that, this, is a, this is a pretty clean solo. Like this is, a, this is the kind of thing that needed some character beyond hair. It was more like, to me, I wanted, to, I wanted the roundness of the room on something where, like on the Mud on the Tires, has the, that great low part. Right? You know what I mean? Those chords. Yeah. And you hear those thump a little bit on this record. 
Yeah, and that's and and that that uh, that Fendery uh, thing with the Vox. That's I took that out on a tour one time, and that was like, and I'd set it uh, each amp on either side of the drums. It was like one of the greatest tone experiences of my life. Loved it. They, so there's just something about those two things that blend together just kind of perfectly. Yeah. Um, when you uh, when you go into the studio to lay down a a, a solo like this or any solo, um, do you kind of have it mapped out in advance, or do you get in there and just kind of wing it till you find it? I totally wing it till I find it. I'm in. It, we're we're in the. I'm neck deep in this new album, doing the, doing all that stuff right now, where I agonize over whether the solo's right on stuff. It's just as it's maybe the most important thing to me on a record is that that the solos are things that I haven't done a million times. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and um, that's getting harder and harder to do <laughs> as time The, the more like, albums you make, yeah, the harder it is to not you repeat know. yourself. Yeah, you yeah. totally know. I mean, it's like the next thing you know, you're you're like, oh, man, I know, I'm, I know that's on top of somebody's thing. You're in the middle of it. And you're like, who, is, who did that before? Oh, right, I did. <laughs> you're like, I, I yeah. won't get sued. Well, no, I'm not going to get sued. I just sound tired is what I sound. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You know, when, when something, when you know you're biting something, even if it's biting it from yourself, I don't know. If you can't place it, I'm always like, wow, that's just meant to be taken. I don't know. I'm just yeah. going to do it. Yeah. yeah do uh, it. Wait on, the, wait on the attorneys to call, right? Exactly. You know, I mean, we talked about how country music has always embraced guitar rippers, but did you get pushback like in the early part of your career for, you know, you, for, for some of the solos like this, where like, did, were people like, all right, dude, you can do that on eight of the songs, but like, this needs to be a single. You can't, you can't be doing all the noodling on every song. They were pretty good. I mean, I, I for the most part, everybody kind of realized after a while, I, I eased into it too. Like first single was a ballad with no guitar solo. Right. Second single was a ballad with no guitar solo. <laughs> Third single had a ton of guitar solos. Uh, it was a song called Me Neither. And it was it kind of existed to be funny. And, you know, you're asking a girl out basically in the song. And, and it's bluegrass. It's, it's this. It's that, that kind of groove. A lot of, a lot of playing, a lot of fiddle, a lot of guitar. Died at 16 on the chart, but still. <laughs> you know, the next song, ballad, no guitar solo, number one. <clears throat> but then... There's a then, pattern establishing. Totally. But then came, like, my biggest hit after those first few ballads was I'm Gonna Miss Her. And that had solo in it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. It, had, it also was like, that song was, as you know, about the sentiment. It was... It was old timey country making fun of the fact that a guy would pick fishing over this girl and you know, and that and and then there's the uh those kind of things going on in it and so much fun to to just pull off that and nobody noticed the solo in that song so i got by the got it by the goalie and the next thing you know i'm doing whatever i want but you know, it's like anything you um, you start to realize that the powers that be that may or may not have an opinion on guitar solos, they have no idea. They don't know. They, I mean, you, you and I both know you take the guitar solos out of our favorite songs. They may not be our favorite songs. Sure, sure. And the yeah. best solos are like, you know, it's like another, it's like an additional bridge or something in the song. It's sort of a, oftentimes a melody that you could sing. It's just yeah. a scene change. You know, it's, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I couldn't agree more with what you just said a second ago. They, they never know. We never, nobody knows how this thing works or why something's a hit or not, you know, but everyone will, will, uh, will try to tell you that they do. Um, when they try to get, you know, the, the most thing that we run into that you've probably run, ran into as well is you do a TV show or an award show. It's the notorious worst in that sense where they're like, yeah, you know what? Uh, you're at 333 and we really need this to come in under 330. And I'm not kidding. You know, that's that. Yeah. yeah and it's totally. like three seconds. And it's like, yeah. Um, could you cut the, maybe some of the solo? It's like, look, if I was some singer, hired a guitar player who didn't even play on the record, that'd be one thing. But this is part of my presentation of this. Yeah. So yeah. 
So the next thing you know, we're like ending, we're like cheating it a little bit in rehearsals at an award show where it's like, you know, the end of the song, instead of ending with a, we're going, Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah In our case, we'd just be nervous and play it. You know, we're going to play it 10 seconds shorter than it was at Soundcheck anyway, because it's just going to be like, you know, twice as fast. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Well, you've always done such a good job of of maintaining that balance of uh, obviously everybody knows you as being a, a incredible guitar player, but they also know you for your songwriting and your voice and then all the rest of it too. Well, you know, it's uh, for me. I, I somebody has always said, "What would you do if you could, if you had to pick one?" Which is the that's the just absolute easiest, lamest interviewer question, but it's the answer is guitar. Yeah, it's sure. Like, well, it all comes from there. All the rest of it comes from there. You right? and I both. I mean, it's that it's that thing. That's where the love of this comes from. And then there's performing is fun and writing is great and, and all of those things. And it all, I, I wouldn't want to break any of that up. But at the same time, you know, when it's all said and done, you and I will be sitting in an easy chair in a rest home playing the guitar. A hundred percent. Let's jump into this solo here. Mud on the tires. The song is in the key of D. The solo starts toggling between the A and G chords. And this is a very country style thing where you really play over the chord. Yeah, you're right. In fact, that's one of the things I worked out when I was when I was doing this. Like, what makes this solo worthy of even happening at the end of this song? You know, because it's like. Way to get there. Get a little mud on the tide. Why isn't that the end? Right. You know what I mean? So because like, the guitar solo hasn't happened yet. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how so how are you how are you playing that little that little build thing at the beginning? What is that? Up here. And are you plucking all those notes? Yeah, that's not delay. I think that's me playing it. So, so there it is. That's your. Oh, basic. is that? Are you doing that like a bend uh, behind the nut? Is that what yeah. you're doing? Oh wow! Okay. I'm already wrong on figuring this out. I was doing it here. Man, that is hard to land that in the right, exactly right pitch, you know. In low A. Ah. Yeah, so you'd go up to the note, hold it, and then now. The guitar I always play live on this song, which may have been the one I played in the studio, is called Splash. It it was a green crook paisley that he built me that I hated the color of it. It was this mm. cute green. And so I just painted it and it's got this this sort of partridge family looking paint all over it. And we call it splash because it kind of looks like a splash on the front. Mm. And and that we have replaced the nut on that guitar three times because I always play that on one of the tires. And we wear out like the D string before you know it is just touching the first fret. Right, small, right. Every night gets this hammered. So, yeah, when it comes back to the A, that's where I hear a little bit of your Buckaroos Bakersfield sound influence coming in the, on that. <laughs> So you're basically sliding that A chord up a few times. So and there's your bender. But you can do it without it. Okay, so yeah, how would the non-bender, would you just kind of go? That exactly. Okay. But as you can see, here's the thing about a bender. I can do it without a bender, but here's how it sounds without the bender. It's a little yeah. more. Are you plucking the high open E or are you getting that here? 
Plucking. The okay. Finger. Ring finger. Or not, not ring finger. And then what's that? And then, then you get into that real fast little arpeggio thing. Isn't there something kind of like... Yeah, that's right. So, you, so you're just kind of going up a G chord, basically? Yep. With the fingers? Is that all, is that all picking fingers? Yeah, these, these two. Then you get into some crazy pull off, like some of this. What's like? What's all that stuff you got going? On? Something like that. that. Sorry, I can't even remember. Now, when I slow it down, I can't do it. And it goes. You know what I'm gonna do? Watch this. I'm gonna listen to it. I think it's that. How are, yeah, how are you? How are you pulling off? Like, is there a blue note in there? Yeah, so it's like. So down here, you that's all kind of in the, uh, what, kind of pentatonic, boxy... Yeah, so it's like... Now live, what I do, I go... So it's like... So it's like you go, so if you go like this, you're going to stay in these notes here. So there, there's these two open strings. You got Sorry. That's how it ends. Yeah, what so what what is that? Are you doing some little double hits on some of those? Am I hearing that right? I don't think so because I don't think they are. Oh, does that does that start on the open E? Is that lick start on the open E? Let me see here. Yeah, I think so. Oh, wow. What is that? What's that little last thing? So you're How like, would a non B bender player hit that bend? You could do it like this, where you go. 
Yeah, but it's, nice. a lot easier, it's a lot easier with one. <laughs> well, I'm going to send you one. Yeah. When I get that G bender, I'm going to co- come back to this. Watch it with the with the speed real slow, and yeah. really learn the details. And my favorite part of this is these. Oh yeah. So you throw a little like uh, minor seven chord in there. Th- that that whole cool. section, I feel like you really need that G bender because this this is where it gets really beautiful. You can do it, and there's kids in Nebraska that can do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's like I got tune. There you go. Sorry. Ah. There we go. It's harder to do as a chord when you don't have the bender, but you can, it sounds right. So it's. And it's also about like it's what it's the notes the notes that you're leaving ringing while you're doing the G bender. This yeah. it, it gives it that beautiful twist. You know, they're that's pulling where it's each other. basically ripping off a steel guitar for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do all the time. So. Okay, explain that last bit too. What was that? What was that? What was all that stuff? So you'll go. Then it's this. So basically, you're you're bending an A chord. Then this is the hard part without the bender. This is the one that's maybe impossible without, but you can do it. But it's hard. It's this. So, Yeah, but it's like ah. So you're kind of on a little a, the little you're on that little uh, a interval right there, but you're bending up to it. Yeah. Oh yeah, play that real slow. And how's that bend in, into the end there? See, now that is exactly what you were talking about earlier. Your attack is just so freaking country. You know what I mean? Like that's, that is like, that is that all that snapping and popping of it is just, <laughs> that's what, that's the thing that makes it the thing, you know? Drives the cowgirls wild and my wife <laughs> mad. <You're insane. laughs> oh, nothing makes my wife angrier than me playing guitar. Are you kidding? Jesus. <laughs> And that is, it doesn't it close it out with like a. And then live we go. Yeah, that's all. Yes, unless it's an award show, and then you just go. Yeah, no award show. (laughs) We'll be right back as I'm playing the solo. You'll hear that. Right, right, exactly. Gary Underwood. <laughs> hey, buddy, do you would you uh, uh, be so kind as to take a few fan questions while you're of here? Because I love, I always throw it up on my social media who I'm interviewing. And- I feel like I blew the middle part of this, but they'll figure it out. It's fine. All right, yeah. Hey, if you want to take another stab at it, and, no, you know, no, no, no. Feel I, free. It's this main first part that I play so different live, where it's like- <laughs> that's it. But see, when I go fast, I can do it. Yeah. When you slow it down, it's like, do you exhale or inhale on your golf swing? <laughs> I don't know. 
Well, now we've got that you doing that isolated so people can, you know, like throw that into their amazing slower down or whatever and just. Yeah, you know. they'll figure it out. And they'll tell me I'm probably wrong there, too. But that's all right. Well, for sure. You know, I, I on that tip, I think I told you this years ago when I when I got this. I got this thing that was like how to play guitar like Brad Paisley. Um, you're, there was like an instructional series, and and sat there and woodshed it on a bunch of them. And the one that really stuck in my mind, and I've always wanted to ask you if this is even in fact one of your licks. But I mean, I use this. All the time, like every night. I think it's even in my latest song, it's in, in the guitar solo, I, I put it in there. But it's it's like a pull-off thing in G. And it's just like minor, go, just pulling off the pen, minor pentatonic scale with the open strings. Is that a Brad Paisley lick? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's so me to pull off. I love pulling off and using open strings as much as I can because it's really, to me, it has a sound that you don't get another way and yeah but that's like my the instrumental on the first record's called nervous breakdown it's almost that lick it's yes and that's the that's the whole and and even in there's some licks that i really like in uh like i'm gonna miss her where it's like i'm gonna miss her I love doing those things. And I got that. I kind of stole some of that thinking. John Jorgensen with Desert Rose Band, an amazing sure. punk player. My, my favorite telly player ever, honestly. He he always incorporated like hammer-ons and, and pull-offs like that. And right. I always was like that with a with a box amp or, or a Dr. Z or anything like that, where there's something about the way those frequencies, when you go... <laughs> there's just immediately like... There's anger in that. Do you, do you do a lot of those like cascading scales or those kind of open string scales? Like, yeah. um, you know, like that. Yeah. Like all that kind of stuff? For sure. It, yeah, all the time. And in fact, like like the Tix solo has a lot of this open stuff. Like, uh, uh, isn't that hard to read? It's like there's stuff like that in it, you know. Like yeah. that like at any key, you can kind of get away with it, except maybe F sharp or something. But it's like even then, it probably sounds good. If you're, yeah, and to go back to what you said earlier, if you just get over it, if you pass over it quick enough, you can almost kind of play anything. Well, you know? I mean, Miles Davis would, what, you know, no wrong notes, right? I don't know. I'm trying to, like, if you try to incorporate those notes and then you try to dig yourself out of the hole, it's pretty fun. <laughs> just stand on the g <laughs> oh man i i love that stuff man it is like it's that stuff with like when you get into that those open string cascading scale lick things it just sounds like it's the lead is falling in on itself like what is happening you know things are coming from every direction i, I love that james, james burton even started that stuff back with even the elvis things he was doing like he would do the uh, I mean, it would be like, what did he just do? And he's still got it. It's, it's right. Crazy. Yeah. God, I got to get him on this show. I will tell you, country music is well represented on this show so far. And you know what's not? 80s rock. I can't get any of those guys to do it. You would think those it would be, you know, there's you, you just wouldn't think it would be that hard. I can't get any of those guys to do it. But so far, country music, we got Brent Mason. We got Brad Paisley. We got John Osborne. You could throw Lindsey Allen there. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be good. All right, let's get into some fan questions. And, uh, and you might know my friend, Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke, but his, uh, his question for you was Don Rich or Roy Nichols? Oh, uh, I think Don Rich, just Don Rich was like Roy Nichols was great too, but, but Don, 
Oh man. I mean, the fact that he was, I, to me, a Haggard record with Roy Nichols was a magical thing, but it was magical already. The Buckaroos with Buck and Dawn. That was it. That was, that was a, that was a chemistry. I mean, you know, he would introduce Don, Buck would introduce him every night as my right arm. Right. Yeah. I mean, and Buck was no slouch. Buck played on sessions in LA, but here comes Don Rich, who's the best guitar player that you could have ever imagined. And he's coming up with stuff that just, those two guys with dimed twins. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. yeah. Dimed. And the treble dimed. Yeah, yeah. At Carnegie Hall, you know they didn't know what hit them. Yeah. Oh, that must have ripped their faces off. And weren't they weren't they like playing like like flat wound strings and stuff too? I mean, it's, it's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As well as no monitors. Right. Sure. sure. And I, as people have said to me, if you could, if you had a time machine, what would you go back and see? For me, it's not. It's I mean, the, a close second would be. Hendrix when he walked out and covered Sgt. Pepper's the day it right. came out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number one would be Buck and the Buckaroos live at Carnegie Hall when nobody thought they should even be there. Yeah. They've been invited and Buck really saw that as the moment that they that they had made it in the eyes of the music community. And right. And for me, I think it's the best country album of all time. It's live, it's played perfectly. They couldn't fix anything. Yeah. It went down to two track. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. crazy. So. Yeah, you have to assume in those days there was no going back and um, patching stuff up. It was just what, whatever it was, it was. Um, and you were friends with Buck, weren't you? Didn't you get to know? Him? Yeah, he was. He was amazing and and took me under his wing and was uh, yeah got to got to do some things a lot with him over the years and and that is something I'll I just never regret. It. When I started, when I married my wife and we started living in LA LA part time, I would drive up for lunch in Bakersfield on any day that she was working and I had nothing to do. I would go up and just have lunch with her. And we'd oh, sit wow. and you know, work, in the, work around in the studio. We'd do, do a few things or we'd just go eat and we'd talk and the next thing you know, I'd show up on a Friday and sit in with the Buckaroos or whatever. It was yeah. Like, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, John Newsy 84 has two questions for Brad. How did your start at Bluebird Cafe shape you as a songwriter and performer? Uh, and then da, 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 I visited Nashville in March and caught your performance with Dawes at the Rhyme, and it was incredible. Do you enjoy the challenge of playing to another band's audience? Yeah, for sure. I definitely both uh, the Bluebird. I I didn't play there a lot in the beginning. I played there a few times. I did an open mic night one night, and in the beginning, before I even had a a publishing deal, and. You just realized the thing about Nashville that that isn't the case in other cities to this degree. When you play anything in Nashville and you are standing in, on a stage in that town, especially a songwriter night or a place that's known for that, like the Bluebird or 12th and Porter or one of the famous clubs that we've got down. Ace Clubs used to be there. I'm trying to think. We've lost Douglas Corner, which was a great place. Um, but like... You know, when you're up there, there's way better people in the audience than you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that is the case of the city. And it's like, so, and you know that, especially when you're aspiring and you're up there singing your song and you're going, oh God, they are evaluating this. And if you win them over in a town like Nashville, you're on to something. Right. Because I remember playing the Bluebird early on and having people come up and say, and hand me, their numbers saying they wanted to co-write, which was a great sign yeah. as opposed to you played and everybody's like, you, you, you need to go home. <laughs> well, I mean, were you going up there and playing songs that you had just written by yourself? Like, was this before you were you know, even writing with other people? Yeah, for sure. I was foolish and did that. And nowadays you're, it's different now than it was back then. It was a little foolish because if you didn't have the means to get that cut quicker than them, somebody might write it. Somebody might take it and they could change it enough, you know. Oh, wow. You're, you're giving a hook away. If they right. Um, right. You got to be careful of that. But these days there's YouTube. So you're going to have, and all of that, there's video cameras everywhere. And so you're going to have a record that's like, hey, I, I sang that already. Yeah. 
I did that that night. So it's a little less risky now. That's the only good thing about all this extra social media. Really, did, I mean, did you did that ever happen to you or anyone that you were tight with? No, I'm lucky in that sense. I mean, there, well, yeah, there were some songwriter friends of mine, but it didn't happen in that way. I've had some songwriter friends that pitched ideas to other writers, and then the the writer went and wrote it. Uh, and you can't copyright an idea, and that isn't necessarily illegal, but it's wrong, right? In right. our in yeah, our time, sure. I mean, you don't write for long in Nashville if you do stuff like that. Yeah. Anywho. Buddy, thank you for doing this. It was so great. You're so generous with, with your time, and I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm honored. Uh, you know, again, I, if anybody can play the solo better than me, you'll do better than I did. But I'll, I'll <laughs> come up with it at least right there. Well, we're going we're gonna to challenge people to watch this episode, learn it, and post it, and we'll see what they come up oh, with. Oh, they'll kill it. It'll be great. Yeah. yeah. Epic, man. Thank you. All right, that was Brad Paisley on Shred with Shifty. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be woodshedding that thing for a long time to try to figure out the intricacies of that beautiful solo. We're going to be back in two weeks with my man Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke. We broke down Waiting for the Thunder. You're going to love it. We'll see you soon. Adios, amigos! One, two, three! Shred with Shifty is created and hosted by me, Chris Shiflett. Produced in partnership with Double Elvis, Volume.com, and Premier Guitar. If you're digging the show, make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button so you get our new episodes when they come out every other week. Volume.com is a free platform with live stream performances, concert broadcasts, and a video archive that includes performances by Brothers Osborne, Stone Temple Pilots, Dirks Bentley, Weezer, and more. Shred with Shifty is produced by Jason Shadrick. Our executive producers are Brady Sadler and Jake Brennan for Double Elvis. Engineering support by Matt Tahaney and Matt Bowden. Our video editors are Dan DeStefano and Addison Savan. Special thanks to Chris Peterson, Greg Necron, and the entire Volume.com crew. Adios, amigos.